It is always something of a mystery when you take up the tantalising offer of a full season rod on a new stretch of river. That was the exciting prospect I found myself in back at the beginning of April 2017. I have fished the River Froome above and below Dorchester many times in the past 20 odd years, but never on this new piece of fishing. Its exact location will remain with me and the fish, as it is very private. How will the river fish? Are there enough fish to catch? And of what size? I was really looking forward to finding out. This would be the first time ever I had had a season rod on any stretch of chalk stream. I gave up my river keeping, guiding and fly fishing instruction work back in 2003. At least now I could go fishing for my own pleasure again. Now there's some enticing little patches of gravel that I'm putting the fly, putting the fly down because the way the light is, it's difficult to see into the water to, to actually try and spot a fish. But in the past days that I've been fishing down here, I've seen fish out over these patches of gravel. Now, as the ranunculus grows, the patches of gravel get smaller and smaller. And that's one of the reasons why it makes it difficult to spot the fish. Because from two thirds of the way across the stream, it's in shadow from the from the willow trees up on the right here. Well, that went very quickly. Today is the 28th of September and it's my last day down on this lovely piece of the River Froome, just below Dorchester. Had a great season. Uh, it's been a bit up and down and a bit patchy because uh, in June, July and August and then into September we've had some atrocious weather and the river has been coloured and high and when it gets coloured it really puts the fish down and puts them off their food. So We've come down today, this last day, we had some overnight rain yesterday and into the early hours of this morning and uh, when we got down here the river has not come up as much as I thought it would. Um, it's a little bit coloured but slowly slowly in the, during the course of the day I'm hopeful that it's going to get a little bit clearer as the slug of high water comes down from further upstream. Anyway, I'm just going to go out on the stream now and uh, see what happens. It's always a bit fraught when you get into the stream at this time of year. Everything's all the banks are overgrown. And sometimes, especially with this slightly murky water that we've got, sometimes with the overhang of the foliage and the, the herbage, you can't necessarily see the bottom. So uh, as I get older, rather than a headlong charge in, I get down on my backside and slide in until I touch bottom. I find it a lot safer. I did have the privilege to cast my line on a historic fishery on the River Itchen above Winchester. I fished as a regular guest of the leaseholder for 15 years, up until 2009 when the lease was not renewed. That did not mean I could go fishing whenever I liked. The rigours of river keeping, guiding and teaching were not conducive to personal fishing. Time was of the essence and when guiding, the client always came first. As the 2017 season on the Froome unfolded, there would be some very high bits and some unexpected low bits. Well, 
the river is really out of sorts today. There's hardly anything hatching. Just the odd one or two small spurring, I think they are, or pale wateries. But there's just not enough to get any fish up and feeding at the surface. And the way it is, there's still a lot of ranunculus. It's been unbelievable, the growth of the ranunculus uh, this summer. And uh, three weeks ago, it was so thick and luxurious that it had grown over all the gravel runs where the fish would, would hold up and lie, waiting to come up to the surface to take, take an insect. But it basically just covered the whole of the river. But in the last fortnight or so, it's starting what becomes the winter dieback. And then of course it will grow again next spring. But because of the overnight rain we had last night, the river's come up and it's a little bit murky. And I'm afraid in conditions like this, it just puts the fish off, it just puts them down. It's a pity really because uh, Plenty of fish in there, as I've proved during the course of my season. Fish-wise, it's been absolutely brilliant. I think they did a rough count earlier on, and I think I've had, in the course of the season, not that I've fished it every every day that I'm allowed, uh, I think I've had 35 brownies, uh, all all wild, and. Uh, and I think I've had four grayling, four or five grayling. Nothing big, only the biggest grayling was about 14 inches, I think. And the biggest brownie I had was 15, which was, it was absolutely pristine. Fin perfect, a specimen wild brownie like you'd expect from a chalk stream. And that, uh, that was right at the start of the season. That was on only my second visit in April when the granum was hatching and it took a dry fly. And I've caught all my fish except one on the dry fly this year. And uh, I'm really pleased with that because it's a fun way to fish. It's a fun way to fish. Anyway, I think it's time for a cuppa. So we're gonna walk back to the car and uh, perhaps have a little shorter session later on, just in case something, uh, something materializes, but I'm not too hopeful after. <laughs> after this morning and uh, this little short session now. Anyway, what will be, will be. On this, my last day of the 2017 season, let's turn back the clock and return to those early spring days of April and the start of my new season and recap on how it all unfolded. The birds are singing again. This magical time of the year is here again. All through April, there were some prodigious hatches of granum, but the fish didn't always respond to the surface activity from the hatching insects. I got lucky and on two occasions through April, really did get it just right. The fish were at last looking up and taking fly off the surface. It is always the case. Potluck decided our HD cameras and operator were not on the river for the big hatches of Granham. I managed to take some still images at the time of the wild brownies I caught on a dry fly when the Granham were hatching. And then of course, about a month later, into May, we had the mayfly to look forward to. And given the right conditions, we could expect some spectacular fishing, if the weather held. The mayfly, Ephemera danica, is without doubt one of nature's marvels. The Dorset Froom, along with the Test and Itchen in Hampshire, is renowned for its prolific hatches which the trout and grayling will rise to and suck down greedily. 
This one moment encapsulates why we, as fly fishers, travel all over the world to cast our flies and see amazing things. The Dorset Froom has a very good mayfly hatch, although for me, in 2017, it was patchy on the days that I fished. On the three days I was on the river during this time, the water was high and murky due to overnight rain, one of which was a filming day. This archive footage was taken some years ago on the River Itchin. I have spent over 10 years filming these astonishing creatures. I never tire of their ephemeral endurance and beauty. You can see, as I bring to the net, a mayfly caught wild brownie, just how cloudy the water is. The mayfly trickled off for most of the morning, and a few fish were rising. Pretty fish, pretty fish. Come on, my little beauty. Come on, my little beauty. Isn't that pretty? Ha <laughs> ha, first of the day. Just get a rough estimate of his length. Oh, just over 12 inches. Lovely. He's gone. Ha <laughs> ha. This metamorphosis from Dunn to Spinner is compulsive viewing. It takes the insect about 20 minutes to complete this transformation. The mayfly cycle begins with the eggs hatching into tiny nymphs. They burrow into the fine gravelly silt of the riverbed. As they develop in their burrows, it will take at least a year, they have to shed their skin numerous times. These are called instars, getting bigger until they reach maturity and grow to over an inch long and are very aggressive. In this sample tray, these nymphs are on the verge of swimming up to the surface to emerge into the dun. You can tell by the very dark thorax and wing buds. They are ready. This first stage from nymph to dun is over very quickly. The dun must fly away off the water very swiftly to the bankside undergrowth and hide in the shade. There's predators about waiting to feast. Birds are waiting to pluck them from the air. They have youngsters to feed and brown trout waiting to slurp them down from the surface. The mortality rate is high for the hatching duns. It could be as high as three to one that don't make it to the egg laying stage. This female dun has just emerged. The right wing has not released from the exoskeleton correctly and is deformed. This insect is condemned to an early death by trout. This truly wondrous ephemeral insect, Ephemera danica, have no mouth parts so they can't eat or drink. Once safely transformed into the perfect insect, the spinner, conserving energy is the main preoccupation. Finding shade and hiding in the undergrowth is very important to their survival until joining the throng to find a mate. I can only think they are here for only one purpose, to procreate and provide food for a multitude of creatures. Reaching the safety of the vegetation, the newly hatched duns can now rest in the shade. Their tiny feet have hooks on the ends. This helps grip the leaves. They hang around overnight, waiting. The final transformation into the perfect insect will happen sometime during the following day. This extraordinary makeover can take 20 minutes if there is a hitch usually resulting in a fatality. But if all goes well, it takes about 12 minutes. This one, by the wonders of the digital world, has been sped up by 250 times to about 40 seconds. It is worth looking at what happens, for there is a whole new entity just waiting to emerge. These insects have very little to hold on to, 
just those tiny claws dug into the comfrey leaf, which they use like miniature ice picks. In the shade of the bankside fringe, in their thousands, up and down the river, they await their destiny. For this female done, it will not be long, as this bubble of fluid at the tail root shows. Already gone through this metamorphosis, from dun to spinner, is this perfect male, resting after its transformation. If they can remain undisturbed, hanging in the shade, they will expend less energy. This male spinner got jumped by a ladybird going about its morning constitution. Having to fly away is more effort wasted. The thorax splits and slowly new life emerges. It is a slow process, life within a life. But once the process starts, there is no stopping. The outer skin is shed and it becomes only a hollow leftover. The abdomen is pulsing, releasing all the ties to the old skin, and the tails are slowly following, right from their original tips. It is a marvel that never disappoints me. The tiny, empty claws of the shuck are the only things clinging on until this exquisite creature can summon up the strength to clamber up onto the reed stem. Here, she will rest in the shade, her gossamer wings drying and stretching, before she joins the mating dance. This can be fraught with danger. The males are insatiable and will gang up on the females. There can be as many as four males trying to couple with one female. It's the survival of the fittest. Finally, she finds a mate and they join. Now too heavy to fly, they sink into the undergrowth to consummate their union. Coupling complete, the males, their job done, fly off, generally, to die in the meadows. While the females, after resting, will return to the river to lay their eggs. They will fly upstream to counter the current and dip their ovipositors through the surface film, injecting a few eggs at a time. As dusk settles over these ancient water meadows, this huge egg-laying spree will last well into the early hours of the following day. As for the trout and grayling, they leisurely cruise about the stream, sipping down this bountiful supply of protein. Although, for the fly fisher, this can be some of the toughest and most exacting fishing of the season, there is so much food. The presentation of our flies has to be spot on to stand any chance of success. As the sun climbs into the sky at the start of the new day, a few stragglers are still to be seen drifting down in the last throes of egg laying. The final chapter is being played out. Death is close by. Stuck in the cloying meniscus, their lifeblood ebbing away. The final few females are slowly dying, their egg laying complete. The current carries them to quiet corners of the river, where the last convulsions of their short ephemeral life is played out. I was carefully wading upstream, up the right-hand fringe. I saw a fish rise right in close to my upstream right-hand bank. The wind was atrocious though. I made to wade over to midstream, where I could change the angle of the cast, get the wind to help me. I got lucky.
wide than that. Pretty. <laughs> Lovely little wild brownie, about nine inches. God, that wind's tricky. But like sometimes happens, I got lucky. That's why I crossed over the river to give me a different angle and to hopefully get the wind. And the wind actually helped me a little bit. But uh, with these long leaders. It's uh, never straightforward with uh, with a difficult wind. Look at the swan over there, just above the, just above the reeds. The luxuriant growth of the ranunculus we had on the beat this year is exceptional. These characters have been making hay, fortunately making no inroads into the waving tresses. But come a year of extra low water levels, swans can lay waste to whole lengths of chalk stream. I have seen firsthand what damage they can do. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that lovely? <laughs> that was a bonus. That's a bonus. He's gone already. I saw that fish it was just here and it just moved under the surface and there was just a little dimple and my fly was already drifting towards him so I left the fly there and he took it straight away. That's brilliant. As my dry fly lands right on target the trout is completely deceived. With all the state-of-the-art equipment we use today the 2017 season has been delightful. Once a week I can find a bit of peace and quiet in this idyllic place. 
away from the hustle and bustle. But still bubbling away just below the surface is that thrill as an eight-year-old who caught his first flounder way back in 1958. So, as I leave the 2017 season behind me, I do look forward to what is to come in 2018 and more escapades on the unforgettable chalk streams of southern England.